Today, as you listen to this teaching by Pastors Ralph and Joanne Hone, we hope you'll enjoy it and learn some practical ways to walk into the awesome life God has for you. For more information and for more free teaching, visit our website, www.tapintothesource.com. So awesome that we are free. If you want, you can follow along in our notes up here or also on your apps. But Ephesians 1 verse 7, he is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. You know, just like the freedom of our country was paid for by the blood of many, many soldiers who laid down their life, our freedom spiritually in our emotions, our soul, in our heart was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we want to go um, a little bit deeper into that. The good news for us is, you know, what we're seeing all over the world right now is that our freedoms um, are being taken away. Many countries have lost all freedom within their, um, all, you know, within their life, within finances, within um, their rights as Christians, whatever. The g- good news is our freedom in Christ can never be taken away. The only one who can ever take that away is you by choosing to walk away from Jesus Christ. But otherwise, it is always available for us. It is always there and no law no country, no person can take that freedom away from you. Second Corinthians 3.17 says it this way, For the Lord is the Holy Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You know, the Spirit of the Lord can be wherever two or more gather in his name. When you cry out to God, the Spirit of God shows up. So when we cry out to God, when we bring God into situations, the Bible says there's, God says that when the Spirit shows up, freedom shows up. Answers show up to situations that we're walking through. And so as we look at this, uh, let's learn to live with the Spirit and His presence and experience more and more of God in our lives so that we can walk in freedom wherever we go. So as we increase learning how to live in the presence of God, his freedom will increase in us. So um, it's like a direct measure. If we want more freedom, that God kind of freedom in our life, we have to increase the presence of God in our life. We have to increase that relationship with him. As we do that, more freedom will start piling into your life. If we neglect God, we will neglect, I'm tongue-tied today, neglect his presence, what we're doing is we're neglecting freedom. And so often we want the freedom from God, but yet we don't want to spend the time to cultivate the presence of God. So what we're saying is we're going to talk about what freedom looks like, but we've got to realize if we want that God kind of freedom, we need to be cultivating that relationship that prioritizes his presence and the relationship in the person of God. You know, what does God's kind of freedom look like? Uh, We're going to hit you with about 13 bullet points here today of what God's freedom kind of looks like. He said there's a freedom from worry. 1 Peter 5, 7 says it this way, Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. You know, I love one thing great about God. You know, you have people that always bring their, their, their despair and their, and, and their uh, depression when they show up. You have people, just keep looking straight. You know what I'm talking to. You got people like that in your life, and you're thinking, oh boy, here they come again. You know, with God, he says, please bring it over here. This is the dump site for you to get rid of all that fear and all that worry. Now, when you dump it, he wants you to leave it there so that when you walk out, you walk out in freedom. For some people, they've been bound, well, we call it today Christian concern. We don't call it worry. Well, I was just concerned. I was, you know, I, did you hear about? <laughs> no, no, no. The Bible says that if we're in any area of our life that we're worrying, oh, I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to get sick. Oh, this is going to happen. Oh, my finances. Oh, oh. You know, the Bible says that today has enough worries. You don't, you don't need to worry about what's going to happen next. But I like what the Bible says, just cast all your care. If you're casting something off, you're, you're throwing it off. You're getting rid of it. You're not holding on to it anymore. God says, come and just cast this and walk in my freedom. You know, I know as a mom... I've loved learning this because, you know, we, wouldn't it be great to never have to worry about your children? 
Are we concerned for them? Yes. But God says we don't have to worry. We don't have to have that torment. Worry has a torment aspect to it. Concern has a, an action to it. Concern is, you know what, I really care about my children. I'm con you know, con concerned about what they're doing. I'm going to pray. I'm going to take action. I'm going to rest in what God says about them. You know, these petition forms like we talked about, that Pastor Brad talked about, is one of the greatest ways we find to cast your cares on him. If you're worried about something, if something's just plaguing you, if there's torment in it, write it down. And there's something about tangibly writing it down, and then when we pray over it, that's a way to tangibly say, I'm giving this to you. It's in your hands, God. We don't have to worry about it. Now, one of the other things is freedom from failure. Philippians 4.13 says, For I can do, everybody said, for I can do, I can do all things, all things through Christ, through Christ, who gives me strength, who gives me strength. So when we realize, you know, it doesn't say that you're not going to fall, that you're not going to fail once. There's a difference between failing and being a failure. Come on, somebody. Failures, I've quit, I've given up, what's the point? There's no point, I've already been, I've hit bottom so many times. I want you to know something. In Christ, the Bible says this, you might fall seven times, but you'll just keep giving up. Getting up. Getting up. Yeah. Did I say giving up? <laughs> yeah. My bad. Getting up. Yeah, that's a good one. That's why I'm here. Thank you. I thought it was just for your good looks, you know. Yeah. That too. Um, anyways, with this, realizing when we fail, if we don't quit and we just keep getting up and getting up and getting up, the Bible says that God says, through Christ, I can do all things. So there's no way of saying, well, I can't do this. I still remember uh, the interview with Ben Carson that he had. He was running, he's running for president, and he grew up in the slums of Detroit. And they said to him, how did you become this amazing surgeon? He was the surgeon at John Hopkins University Hospital where they took the twins that were joined at the head, and he took them. He was the surgeon that performed that surgery. Growing up in the slums of Detroit, in the hood, Mr. Carson, how come you didn't fail like everybody else did? This is good. This is worth everything today just to hear this. My mother wouldn't let us come up with excuses. See, what happened? How come you quit? Well, you don't know what happened to me. This happened in my life. Get up! Get up! Get up! Come on. Yeah. We're the church. The glorious church. Didn't say we didn't take a hit from the devil, but he ain't going to keep us down. Yeah. Things might have not happened your way. Maybe somebody passed away in your life. Maybe this happened. Maybe that happened. But you know what? Things happen. Get up. Get up. See, you won't fail if you just keep getting up. God says there's something resilient about that one. There's something supernatural. Watch this. I'm going to put some extra favor, favor and glory on them. What they've learned in the bottom pit, when they get up, they won't do that again. I'm going to set them up and they're going to walk in a level of freedom like they've never walked. Come on, church. That's us. Freedom from failure. If Ben Carson can do it, you can do it too. I can do it too. Isn't that good? Yes. Jesus set, it up, set us up so we can walk in that. And in that, we never have to be worried about what he's asking us to do. Because so often we just don't want to do what he says because we're scared we're going to fail. But he's saying here that we can do everything because Christ strengthens us. So you know what? We need to do what he asks us to do and have a boldness in us that says, you know what? I'm going to accomplish it. I might trip a few times, I might stumble, but I'm going to get there. I'm going to do it because of him. Freedom from need is the next thing that he brings us. Philippians 4 verse 19, and this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs. Does it say some? Say all. Say all. All your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. You know, when we live in Christ Jesus, when we live with him in our life, when we live with him centrally focused in us, all of our needs are met. All of our needs. Now, we may not get all of the mansions and the become billionaires or whatever else, but every need you have, whether it be physical, spiritual, emotional, 
is met. We don't have to worry about being in lack. You know, we are seeing people paralyzed in fear about lack and, you know, making crazy decisions because they're so scared that they might go without one day. And they end up in corruption and they end up cheating and everything else because they're so scared of lack. The thing is with Jesus, when we're living with him, we don't have to worry about that. You know, the Bible says that if he clothes the birds of the air so beautifully, won't he take care of you and I even more so? You know, sometimes I think we can trust God for so many things, but when it comes to actually taking care of us, we kind of default because it's kind of too scary. Um, but he wants to take care of our needs. Now, the next one is freedom from sickness. Yeah. First uh, Peter 2, 24 says it th this way. But th through his wounds, we were healed. Not might get healed, not could get healed. We were healed. Yeah. So there's a healing that's available our freedom from sickness that God, that Jesus picked up at the cross. Isaiah 53 talks about it in detail. At the end of this service, we're going to have communion. At communion, we will pray for those that need a touch from God. God will supernaturally show up and do supernatural things because that's what a supernatural God does. See, we want man's results. God says, get my results. Mine operate on the level of supernatural. So when Jesus came, he came to set us free from sickness. And if you're sitting here right now or you're watching online and you're thinking, man, my body has been plagued with sickness and I, I find it hard to believe because I love Jesus because I've been doing all the right things. Tune yourself in and stay with us towards the end of the service. We will pray and God will show up and move mightily on your behalf. Why? Because he loves us. He doesn't have an agenda. God loves us. In the midst of where we're at, even when our bodies are not functioning right, even when we're dealing with this issue or that issue, the Bible says that because of what Jesus did, he'll, we can walk in that divine health and healing for our lives. Do you know, I love this next one. Freedom from weakness. You know, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. But he said to me, my grace is all you need. My power is strongest when you are weak. So I'm very happy to brag about how weak I am. Then Christ's power can rest on me. You know, when we can acknowledge that we can't accomplish what we're supposed to be accomplishing, it's only his power in us. There is a whole freedom there because you don't have to be the one to come up with the greatest ideas. You don't have to be the one who is strong enough to, to do something. It, it is his strength in us. And, you know, um, we were recently in Europe for two and a half weeks and taking our anniversary, 25th anniversary trip. And we came back fully refreshed. But while we were gone, we just were so blessed that we just were able to walk away from, you know, all of our, all the issues, all the stress, all the stuff going on back home. Um, we had a great team here taking care of church life. We didn't have to think about church life. Our kids were well taken care of. We didn't really have to think about them. Um, sorry, no offense, kids, but we didn't really think about them. Anyhow, um, no, we did, but, you know, we didn't worry about them. We weren't dealing with the issues of home, and we came back home. So we were totally refreshed, came back home, hit life the next morning. I mean, we were going full speed. Two days in, I sat before God and go, oh, my goodness, how in the world do I live this life? How do we do everything that we do? And it hit me like a wall of all of, you know, you go from nothing to everything all at one time. You don't realize really how much stuff you deal with in a day. And I sat before God and I said, thank you so much for your grace. Because where I am weak here in my own being, you are so strong. And you, sudden, you realize that in the natural, you cannot do the tasks he's asked you to do. You have to put on the grace of Jesus Christ. And you have to realize that, you know, I, I was like, okay, God, I am so grateful that I realize how weak I am because that means you're powerful and that you're going to do this. And so we've got to realize that when we're weak, he is strong, and that's when we should be excited because we know it's him doing it in us, through us, and for us, right? Amen. Good news. Now, the next thing is freedom from fear and danger. Now, look at 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. I really like this. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. One of them says a, so a sound mind. God hasn't given you a spirit of fear and timidity. So if somebody's trying to keep you quiet, it isn't God. 
God wants you to shout from the mountaintop about how good he is in your life. The devil wants you to keep quiet about that and not let anybody else hear about it. But you notice that fear is a spirit. You know, we have authority over the spirit world. The Bible says that whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. So I take authority over the spirit of fear and depression and I bind it in the name of Jesus. You can do this at home yourself. And the Bible says that in that cause, that fear has no choice because it's a spirit and it operates in the spirit realm and you have authority in that spirit realm because Jesus said whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, so I bind that spirit of fear and I want to loose love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. Come on, somebody. Mm -hmm. You have that authority. But the enemy tries to use fear against us. Psalm 27, I like, 1. I like this one. The Lord is my light and my salvation. So why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress protecting me from danger. So why should I tremble? There is a protection of, from danger that we have in, in Jesus. But yet we don't get a revelation of it. And we have a choice here. You know, God says, I place before you life and death. Choose life. Life is where we have a faith, where we have a trust in God that he's going to protect us. Fear is really just faith in the devil. As we start fearing for our danger, um, you know, our own selves, etc., all we're doing is giving the devil open doors into our life. You know, we, I, I hear people all the time, well, I'm so scared that this is going to happen. I'm so scared that I'm, going to, so scared I'm going to have get cancer. I'm so scared of this. I'm scared I'm going to have a car accident. I'm going to scare. And then it happens. And they go, oh, see, I just knew it. No, you open a door when you start letting fear into your life. We've got to start having a confidence in the fact that God protects. Are there things we're going to go through? Satan's going to throw stuff at you. I guarantee you. He's going to throw sickness. He's going to throw all of these things at you. But we've got to start rising up with a realization that God is a protector. He will protect us from danger. There are so many amazing scriptures. You know, Psalm 91, I love because it talks about how he'll protect us, that stuff can't come on us when we are fully in him, talking um, in his presence, when we're um, in that relationship place, when we're under the shadow of his wings, when we're in that intimacy with him, there is protection from danger. So we freedom, don't need to fear. Freedom from bondage is the next one. Romans six fourteen says it this way, sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. You know, when God stepped up, he did everything he could to put you into a life that is set up for success, into a life that is set up to walk away from being controlled and manipulated. He set you up so that you would walk like Jesus did on the streets. Jesus was our prototype. But you know what? A lot of times we get caught in bondage. But the Bible says, but sin no longer is your master. Sin no longer can control you because Jesus paid for it. We come to him when we confess our sins. The Bible says he is faithful and just and he'll forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when we come to him, his grace is so powerful that he walks in and just cleanses us. Now grace is not the license to sin. Well, I'm fully covered. I can do whatever I want. Because a lot of people live that way. Delusional. Oh, I can do whatever. Really? Can you do whatever you want and get away with it in your life? No. So why would that be any different with God? God has a heart where when we confess, when we mess up, when we do things, he'll clean our, he'll clean our slate because our heart is right towards coming. But if we say, oh, well, God's going to cover it anyway, no big deal. The Bible says it's like spitting in the face of Jesus. But we have to understand grace is the power to not sin. So when there is a bondage in your life, when you're just stuck in something, here he's saying grace brings freedom to that because grace empowers us to not live in that anymore. See, we don't have to get rid of the bad habits and the addictions in our life. The grace of God does. So we've got to look at it differently. We've got to realize that there's freedom in him. And as you run into him, his grace can start hacking that down. His grace can start empowering you to say no. You still have a choice. But his grace will come on you and say, no, look, I'm going to help you walk through this. I'm going to help you say no to that. And he'll start bringing you freedom. 
You know, the next thing you have freedom from is freedom from ignorance. Now, if that doesn't motivate you to get all of your friends and family saved and evangelized, I don't know what will. Because <laughs> I know how many of you have kind of like run into that. Don't raise your hands. But anyhow, don't look at your neighbor either. Especially do not look at your neighbor. But 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. Because of what God has done, you belong to Christ Jesus. He has become God's wisdom for us. He makes us right with God. He makes us holy and sets us free. So God made Jesus Christ wisdom. So as we have Jesus living inside of us, right, there is a wisdom from God that is within us that we can tap into, that we can um, follow, and that we can have access to. The thing is, so often we're just so busy with our own thoughts and our own wisdom, we won't take the time to actually listen to what God's wisdom is, to what, you know, your spirit inside is trying to tell you. Because I know, maybe I'm the only one, but you go to do something you're not supposed to do and something inside is just telling you not to do it. Anybody ever? Okay. And you do it anyways, right? But what he wants to do is he wants us to start tapping into that wisdom. When it starts saying, something starts coming to you, it's like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, you know we've just walked through a business deal um, in our own um, personal business where God just dropped an idea into Ralph that was like, whoa, it has been in front of me all the time. But as he was spending time with God, all of a sudden, there's just a little bit of shift of wisdom to open up a whole new venue of business. That's the kind of wisdom he has that's in us, that's tapped, but we have to tap into it. But if we've got Jesus Christ in us, let me tell you, wisdom is unlimited access to us. But we've got to tap into it. We've got to start listening to his wisdom and not our own. For, uh, freedom from evil, 1 John 4, 4. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the Spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. You mm. notice there's two spirit worlds going on. Yeah. Did you get that? There's two going on. But the Bible says that when you have Christ in you, his very spirit lives in you, and it's greater than the spirit that's on the earth. So in other words, when you're tempted, when you want to do some stuff yeah. that's not good, that spirit that's in you is screaming, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. The spirit on the earth is saying, go ahead and help yourself. Just enjoy what you want. Enjoy the pleasures of the flesh. Enjoy all this. And your spirit is saying, don't touch it with a 100-foot pole. See, your spirit, the Bible says, is greater. We just have to learn to be obedient to what the spirit of God is speaking into our lives. I know for me, if I would have listened to God many more times, I would have saved myself a lot of aggravation. Can I get an amen? Amen. Because we're all there. But we have the freedom to stay out of evil. Oh, I couldn't control myself. Yes, you can. The spirit that's in you is greater than the one that's on the earth. He will overrule and dominate if you give him the right to do so. Right. The next is an awesome one. Freedom from condemnation. Romans 8 verse 1, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. You know, we've come to Jesus and we've asked him to forgive sin in our life. It's gone. The thing is, how many of you have ever done something wrong and it keeps coming back to mind? It keeps coming back to mind. That is not God bringing it to remembrance. If you have taken it to him and he's forgiven it and you've repented, that is not him. That is the devil. It says the devil has come to kill, steal, and destroy. He is trying to bring that condemnation to try to destroy what God wants to do in you. The Holy Spirit will convict us, but it will never condemn. Conviction is if we are currently doing something we're not supposed to be doing, he'll convict us. He'll, he wants to nudge us. It's that nudge towards him, the nudge to walk away from something dangerous. Um, a conviction can also be that that push to move towards something better. You know, that conviction to spend more time with him in prayer, to read your Bible a little bit more, to go love on somebody. There's that conviction to go do that. But it'll never be condemnation because he has freed us from that. Once your sin is before him and it's forgiven, it is gone. And what an awesome thing. It doesn't matter what you do. You know, Paul, who wrote a good portion of the New Testament, was killing Christians. Yet God forgave him. 
And how over and over and over in the Bible, there's all kinds of people who messed up. You know, David had, King David had an affair and then had her husband killed to try and cover it up, etc. But yet God forgave him. And you can walk in, and it says he was a friend of God. He was a friend of God. So we need to realize condemnation is not where we're supposed to be. We can be free from it. Now the next one is freedom from sin. 1 John 1, 7 says this, But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from some sin. From all sin. The blood of Jesus has cleansed us from all sin. So what was sin was missing the mark. I messed up. We've all been there. I did this. I know. We've all made mistakes. The Bible says when we confess that, though the blood of Jesus covers it up like it never happened. Now, we can go back as... Pastor Joanne talked about, and, 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 and we can look back, because the enemy will always remind you of your past. Mm-hmm. You just have to remind him of his future. Yeah. I read the end of the book, I win, you lose, everything should be okay. See, we have to sometimes get our mind renewed with this and understanding. Mm-hmm. 1 Peter 2, 24 says this, that um, he himself, this is Jesus, carried our sins in his body on the cross, He did so that we would die as far as sin is concerned. Then we would lead godly lives. The old sinful nature of Ralph, of John, of Susie, of Peter, of whatever your name is, would die. And we would come back to life living with Christ in us. That's what they call born again. They always say, what's all this born again Christian stuff? It means the old, boom, Ralph is dead. Thank God. And now Christ comes, and he lives inside of us, and we take on a new nature. We no longer get angry the way we used to. We no longer cuss the way we used to. Why? Because God starts changing us. Does it happen overnight? It sure doesn't. It's a progress. We walk out our own salvation with fear and trembling. We're, we're, we're on board with God, and God's stripping some stuff off of us along the way. The faster we run to God, the more he strips off. And you can't stay in middle ground with God. You're either moving forwards or backwards. The enemy has you on a slippery slope going down, so you better keep running towards God. You know, Galatians 3, verse 22, it said, But the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin. So we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. So without Jesus Christ, you can say you're the best person. I live a good life. You know, well, I believe in God. But if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ and are living with him in this, as the center of your life, sin will dominate your life. And the consequence of sin is death. And so here it's saying that by believing in Jesus Christ, by saying, you know, I believe you. I'm going to actually believe you, and I'm going to believe what you say, and I'm going to believe what you're asking me to do. As we believe in him, all of a sudden now there's a freedom. God's promise of freedom can come in because sin is taken care of. And when sin's out of the way, now we can suddenly step into the great things God's got for him. For us, for you and for me, all of these freedoms can come when we believe in Jesus Christ. Now we want to touch on, and you touched briefly on this, but we want to talk on what freedom is not. Because often when we talk about freedom, we go, oh, praise God, I'm free. I can do whatever I want. Well, (laughs) how many of you know that this country would be very interesting if everybody was free to do whatever they wanted at any time, right? In that very freedom, we lose our freedoms, right? If people were free to come and rob you and shoot you and attack you, our freedom to live peaceably would be gone, right? So it's the very um, rules or laws that bring us freedom. So if you look at 1 Peter 2.16, it says, For you are free, but yet you are God's slaves. <laughs> so don't use your freedom as an excuse to do evil. You know, there is so much talk about 
Well, we live under grace. We don't live under law. Grace is the empowerment to fulfill the law of God in our hearts. And what God said is, is a new covenant I've given you. He says, I've given you a new commandment to love God with all your heart and love others as yourself. Well, that's even harder than the Ten Commandments, let me tell you. Because the Ten Commandments were, it didn't matter what was going on in your heart. You could still hate somebody, but as long as you didn't murder, from, murder them, steal them from them, whatever, you're going to be okay. Now it's saying, no, it's written on your heart, and I want you to love God and love them. And that, if you love somebody, you're not going to kill them. You're not going to steal from them. You're not going to have an affair with their wife, right? So he's written a whole new way for us to do things, but it is not freedom does not give us an excuse to do evil. In fact, Galatians 5.13 says this, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. Don't, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Mm -hmm. Use your freedom to serve one another in love. When we do that as believers, when we start serving other people around us and doing whatever we can to help their lives become successful, well, why should I do that? You, you know what I've gone through in my life? Blah, 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 blah. We'll go off on this tangent. Well, they don't deserve it. You know what? You can come up with whatever excuse because there's something going on in your heart. Or you can do what the Bible says. Well, why do you always help other people? I said, because God's not mocked, whatsoever you sow, you're going to also reap. Well, if you reap helping other people, guess what? People behind you are going to be helping you get ahead. You're going to have favor in places that you never thought you could buy favor in. Currency of favor is way better than currency of money. Come yeah, on, somebody. That's right. So when you sow favor into people's lives, well, they don't deserve it. Listen, you don't deserve it either. But because God's faithful, because his word is true, when I start to help other people, when I start to love on other people, when I start to do things for them, when I decide, you know what, I'm just going to be a blessing, what happens? God turns around and he starts being a blessing to you. Yeah. Over and over and over. It never stops. Because when your heart is towards being a blessing, I love some of the guys around here because they'll pick up the phone and they'll call me. Anything you ever need, Pastor, just call. Ooh, that's a big word to throw out. That's a big phrase to throw out. They'll pick up the phone. They'll say, anytime you need something, just pick up the phone. I'll be there. I'm there. I'm in. Come on, somebody. Mm -hmm. You don't think God's going to be helping them out every time they need a breakthrough? When things should have went the wrong way, all of a sudden God shifted things in their favor? See, we need to realize as believers, God has given us this incredible freedom. But he wants us to walk with him every step of the way. That's why I love that one that we talked about when he's weak. When you're weak, he's strong. If you can get up thinking, God, seriously, I really, <laughs> I really need some help. You know you're at the bottom. God says, no problem. Because when you don't have the ability to accomplish what you want, I have all power in heaven and earth, and I can just declare and decree and release angels. I can release, release favor to come your way. I can do whatever you need. But when you stay and say, well, I got this, God, God says, okay, if you got it, I guess I'll step to the side. See, God wants us dependent on him. God wants, like it said in Scripture, he wants us to be slaves to him. Yeah. In other words, when he tells you to do something, just do it. Doesn't matter what your flesh feels like. Just do it. I'm going to invite everybody to bow your heads and close your eyes and online campus, Winnipeg campus, be part of this as well. I want to give you an opportunity. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, maybe you have never walked with him. Maybe you did at one time, but you've wandered away. Today is the day. And I believe there's people online right now that you tuned in just to check this out, and God says, no, you tuned in because you're going to get your life right with me today. You've been doing it on your own, and it hasn't been working. Pray this prayer with me. I want to invite you to do it. It's the greatest thing you can do for your own life, to make Jesus your Lord and your Savior. It's a really simple prayer, but it's really powerful. 
I'm going to ask everybody to repeat it after me. I won't make you stand up. I won't say, tell you to raise your hands. I'm just going to say, pray it with me because it's a heart issue between God and you. It goes like this, Father, in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name. Forgive me. Forgive me. I need you. I need you. I feel really weak. I feel really weak. I'm inviting you into my life. I'm inviting you into my life. To make me strong. To make me strong. Everything I have. Everything I have. I surrender to you now. I surrender to you now. Jesus. Jesus. Be my Lord. Be my Lord. And my Savior. My Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message. For more free teaching and information about The Source, please go to www.tapintothesource.com.